Today we're going to be talking about one of the more difficult skills that there is that you're going to have to learn. Because we have a tendency to not want to confront people, don't we? And that means we don't get to the real core of what is going on and there's data and things that we're not taking into account because we don't want to make them mad. How many people don't like to confront things so they avoid things? And to be a good counselor, you're going to have to be willing to be honest and open and do what is in that client's best interest and sometimes that's going to be confronting. Realize that we need to confront at right times and so on and so forth and we're going to talk all about that and then we're going to give you some examples to try and help you get some practice of how to effectively confront people. Confrontation is defined to stand face to face with, to face defiantly, to bring together for comparison. There's actually two whole areas of counseling that are just based on confronting. One is called Nuthaleo counseling by Jay Adams. And what he basically does is people come in and he basically shows them where they are not in alignment with what the Bible says. And then he confronts them and says, now change. And that's a whole method of Christian counseling. Then in what's called Gestalt uh, counseling, again, they're identifying those contradictions and those things in the background and those emotions that are buried, and they're bringing those out to the front. And that's all part of this particular skill. What are our goals today? We want to come to some agreement or conclusion about incongruity. When things don't seem to line up, we need to somehow straighten those out and get them to line up. We need to be able to resolve issues, to change behavior. And here's one of the really big issues of our goal, okay, when we're dealing with confronting. Somehow, we've got to confront people in such a way that we stay on the same team. What do I mean? See, when you have some ideas and I have some ideas and we're counseling, we need to be on the same team working in the same direction for the client's good, right? Well, it's very easy in confronting to offend people and make them feel that they're in the opposite team and then they're going to have all these defenses and you're really not going to accomplish the goal of confronting because the goal of confronting is simply clarification, understanding. But we have to do it in such a way that we don't cause that person to now work against us or put up all of these defenses. Do you see the challenge? That's one of the biggest challenges in the area of confronting. And we also need to confront in such a way that we don't lose our clients. Do you realize that you can lose your clients by what you bring up and what you deal with? And if you don't confront it adequately and in the right way? Now the first thing about confronting is you're going to have to observe discrepancies. You're looking for things that are going on that just don't make sense, that just don't fit together like a mixed message. Thoughts or feelings are not congruent. Here are some discrepancies that you're looking for. Conflicts between people that say different things. How many times are you going to get somebody in and they tell you the story of what happened, the other person tells you a totally different story? Well, how are you going to deal with that? You know? Well, I heard Jane say this, and you said that. It sure doesn't seem to, you know, were you guys at the same place? Saying one thing, doing another. How many times are you going to get that? How many clients are you going to get? They're going to agree to do something, but they're not going to do it. Verbal that does not match the nonverbal. Projection on others things that they're feeling themselves. Distortion of truth. How many of us distort the truth? How about all of us to a certain degree? 
thoughts and emotions that do not line up. What do we know? Emotions are controlled by the way you look at it. So if you tell me you're looking at uh, this, you feel that this person is just a wonderful person, but you hate their guts. That tells me there's something wrong here and I'm going to have to deal with it. Boundary violations. Scriptural violations. Violations of personal values. See, if I say my values are this, but I'm doing this, so if I say, I'm a good Christian, I'm living for God, I'm totally sold out for God, but I'm having an affair. What does that tell you? There's something wrong here, isn't there? Because that does not fit along with what the scriptures say. Impasses, where the client is stuck many times due to manipulation, guilt, or past unresolved issues. You have something that just won't happen and just won't work in the session. Like some clients that I had, and we went for six months, and I could not get them to act on the boundaries they agreed on. What am I going to have to say? I'm confused. You keep agreeing that you're going to do this, and then when it comes around to doing it, you don't do it. Because what's their problem? They tend to be passive-aggressive. They're going to agree to anything I say. But that doesn't mean they really agree to it avoidance of certain issues. If every time you go a certain way, like talk about their past marriage or something, it gets diverted some other direction. What does this tell you? And then defense mechanisms. Anytime you see defense mechanisms, that's a sign that there's something going on there that they're defending themselves that they don't want to deal with that maybe you're going to have to confront. What are the standard defense mechanisms? Most of you probably heard these before, but I'll just go over them so you understand what they mean. First is denial. Not acknowledging pain, threat, or hurt. Displacement. Shifting the blame that cannot be expressed to another person. It was, I might be really angry at my boss. Well, I can't express it at my boss, so I take it out on my kids. Identification, taking on another's characteristics to avoid discomfort. I'm around certain people, I act just like them, even though that's not me at all. Intellectualization, emotional distance by abstracting thoughts. You'll have clients that they don't get in their emotions at all. It's all intellectualized, all they do is it's all theory. Projection. Transferring motives, feelings, and wishes to others. The guy who is always blaming his wife and says she's having all these affairs. Be suspicious. Maybe he's having one. Reaction formation. Expressing opposite ideas or emotions from those actually felt. Well, I never have any problems with sexual thoughts at all. If the client's a guy, what's going to, what are you going to come to your mind? Okay? I wonder if that's true or not. And if not, I want to know why it's true. Because it's telling me something. Regression. Reverting to childlike behavior. Had a lady, had borderline personality disorder, her husband mentioned he's going to have to be late for work. She melted down to a three-year-old and started beating on him right in front of me in, in session. That's regression. Repression. Excluding hurtful thoughts in consciousness. They were almost killed, but it's no problem. They don't have any feelings. They're just fine. Sublimation, redirecting repressive, repressed motives and feelings to more acceptable pursuits. You know, you might be helping people that have problems with domestic violence down at the shelter. Of course, you have domestic violence in your own marriage. 
but now you're doing that, so that's better than having to confront what's in your own marriage, instead of a way of confronting it, but not really confronting it. So to get the idea, anyway, those defenses should all be warning signs that there might be areas you're going to have to confront in this person's life. When to do it. This is important. Wait until an adequate relationship is developed. You have to earn the right to confront. Ever hear the saying? That rules without love lead to rebellion? That's with teenagers. See, if you're going to confront them, you may need to know that they're loved, that you care first. When it fits in after the relationship is established, what I'll do many times, I'll just put it in the back of my mind and say, okay, that's some area we're going to have to take on sometime in the future. They may not be ready for it now. So timing is everything. Use the Holy Spirit for timing. See, the good thing is if you have a crisis, that now allows you to confront this issue because it's been brought out in the open. Have your ducks in line before you confront. You have to have overwhelming evidence or they're just going to put up defenses and you can say, well, how do you know? I had a young man on the phone and he's saying, marijuana is not addicting. And I say, well, all the recent research says it is and we have clients that are addicted to it. Have you ever used marijuana? No. Then how do you know? If I'm going to deal with that client, do you see, that's not going to work, is it? I'm going to have to somehow work through those issues and turn it around so that he can accept that and he can look at that in a more, less defensive manner. And that's all part of this skill of confronting. How do you do it? The biggest thing, as I say, whatever you do, you got to keep them on the same team. Because if you now are trying to force your client to do something, or they see you as working against them or trying to make them do something they don't want to do, you're going to lose the client, or you're going to end up in a power struggle with the client, and you're not going to be able to help them, right? Be non judgmental. Use I and we statements. Summarize and give feedback. I was just wondering could this be possible? See, what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to tell them, no, this is the way it is. Be gentle, warm, and caring. clearly have the other person's best interest in mind. You know, we don't really have to deal with this. You're really in charge of the counseling session, but it seems to me that this is an area that probably needs to be looked at. What do you think? See, this is not in-your-face type of stuff. In-your-face type of stuff tends to make the other person get defensive, and then you've lost. On one hand... I hear you saying this, but on the other hand, yesterday I thought you told me just the opposite of that. I'm confused. I use I'm confused a lot. Did I hear you correctly? Now, when you did that, did you realize that you were crossing that other person's boundary? You can use stories. Remember in the Bible when Nathan was supposed to confront King David about his adultery with Bathsheba and killing Uriah? How did Nathan do that? Remember he goes and says, uh, O king, there was this guy. And this guy had many sheep and his neighbor only had one sheep. And a guy came and he took the guy's one sheep and used it for his feast. And King David says, he should die for that. And Nathan says, 
you're the man. That's pretty bold for a king. Remember what a king can do in those days if they don't like the way you confront them? How many other people were about ready to confront him about his affair and killing one of his mighty men? You is in the here and now, or as you see it. You, know, you don't go to a lot of stuff in the past and so on. Right now, what I saw you do was this. What did that mean? Confront in love and hope for the future. My goal for you is that you get past this and you're able to count for everything God wants you to be. Use natural consequences. One of the ways I confront sometimes is I'll say, the choice is up to you. You can do anything you want. In fact, if you want to, you can take another run at the concrete wall. Do you think it's going to break this time? Interventions. You can do a right type of drug alcohol intervention and a wrong type. What's a wrong type of drug alcohol intervention like? Get a whole bunch of people together and they tell the person how rotten they are and what a drunk they are. Is that going to change anything? No, you want to get a whole bunch of people that really love them and they just express how much they love them, how much they believe in them, how much they believe they can get free and how bad they feel that their life is totally messed up. Use perceptions or what they say rather than facts unless the facts are well established. It appears to me that this is what you think. Is that right? Rather than this is what you think, get it together. If they do not agree, don't argue. Give them time to think about it. You know, I could be wrong, but it sure seems to me that this is what's going on. Why don't you think about it for a while and let me know. Head off the layer cake. If you know where they're going to take this in a wrong direction, remember layer cake we talked about? You head the layer cake off. If you know they're going to take this probably as unloving, you're going to start your confrontation with, you know, I love you. You're one of my favorite clients. I think you're a great person. But you know there's one area I think we need to talk about. Do you see how I just headed off the layer cake? With whom do I do it? You must have a relationship, must be part of the problem or part of the solution. It's not your job to go out there judging people, putting people down, trying to straighten people out. Does it affect the area that you're working on with this particular client? You have to think about how it affects you to make sure you're not doing this to just make yourself feel good. It's not a valid reason to confront just because you don't want them to get away with something. It's are you really helping them? Is this something they really need and how is it going to affect them? Only confront the battlefields worth dying on. You're not going just confronting, 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 confronting every little thing that you have to confront and straighten out. Is this a critical thing in their life? Is this something that needs to be dealt with? If the client is fragile, use confrontation carefully. You've got to determine how much are they going to be able to handle and only give them the amount that they're going to be able to handle at any particular point. You notice that God does that with us? What if God just took you and showed you everything you've ever messed up in your entire life and how absolutely screwed up you are? on everything, the day you got saved. Be especially careful not to step on the toes in multicultural situations. You're going to have to make sure that this isn't just a cultural issue that you're dealing with, that this is actually something that you understand and they are understanding it from a correct way, taking their culture into account. Why do counselors and clients not confront? You do not want to embarrass the client. When I was taking my first courses in the pre-practicum, 
we all had clients that we were supposed to be dealing with. And this particular client that I had was blind in one eye. And he was dealing with some self-worth issues and so on and so forth. And I didn't confront that particular issue. And that's why I ended up getting a B in the course. I didn't want to embarrass the guy, right? Well, the problem was that related to the issue. Do you think it might, you have a self-worth issue if you have lost one eye? Think that might affect your self-worth some? You do not like conflict. You're afraid the client might get mad. You do not know how to effectively do it. That's why we're going to be doing the exercises today to try and help you work on these things. You're too codependent. Or you don't recognize the need for it. It's one of those skills you don't use that often depending on the situation, but you definitely need to be able to do this effectively or you're going to be losing some of your capability as a counselor. Now let's take a look at Jesus. And we're going to go through a number of different situations how Jesus confronted things. Luke 4.23 And he said unto them, you will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. Whatsoever you have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, No prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you the truth, Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months, when the great famine was throughout all the land, but unto none of them was Elias sent, but unto Sarepta, a city in Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elias the prophet, and none of them were cleansed, saying, Naaman the Syrian. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. And they rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him under the brow of the hill whereupon the city was built that they may cast him down headlong. Now what was that all about? And of course this confrontation didn't go too well, did it? Jesus was confronting their prejudice. Do people want to have their prejudice confronted? He was saying, hey... I came back here and because you know that I'm from here, you really don't have any faith for me to heal and so on. But I want to let you know, God isn't prejudiced. God will heal anybody, any place. And God loves everybody equally. And the Jews didn't want to hear that. But do you think he needed to confront him on it? He obviously felt he did. And of course, he was speaking for God. Demonstrating the power of God, Luke 5.22. But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said unto them, Why reason you in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Rise up and walk. But that you may know that the Son of God hath power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the sick of the palsy, I say unto you, Arise, take up your couch, and go to thy home. And immediately he arose up before them, and took up that whereon he lay, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. The Pharisees were saying, You shouldn't be healing on the Sabbath. Jesus was saying, Healing is what God does. And then he had said, your sins be forgiven. And they're saying, that's blasphemy. So how did he solve it? He said, well, if that's blasphemy, is God going to do what I tell him? Which is harder? For me to pray for this person, they be completely healed and do a miracle in front of you, or say, your sins be forgiven you. So he was addressing their prejudices again, their ideas of how they saw things, and he did it in a physical way. Overseas, many times, when you're dealing with missionaries, especially in animus cultures, 
where they believe in all sorts of spirits and everything else, what's the only way you're going to be able to confront? Through the power of God. In this one particular village, they had this tree in which they had all their idols and they worshipped this tree. And so they got all the Christians praying against this tree. And the tree died. All of a sudden, the people had to realize that God's power was greater than the power of the spirits that they believed in. And it changed everything. Sometimes you have to confront in that particular way. Here's another one. And Jesus answered and said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And they said unto him, Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers, and likewise the disciples of the Pharisees, but thine eat and drink? And he said unto them, Can ye make the children of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is still with them? But in the days will come when the bridegroom shall take away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. You can use natural examples in situations to confront and say this situation is sort of like this natural example. Do you see that? Confronting limitations so they rely on God. Luke 9, 13. But he said unto them, Give ye them to eat. And they said, we have no more than five loaves and two fishes, except we should go and buy meat for all this people. See, why did Jesus do that? He recognized they weren't believing that God could actually do these kind of things, and he challenged their faith level by saying, okay, hey, you raise that person from the dead, okay? What goes through your head now? Well, do I have enough faith? Would I really believe that would happen? Could that really happen? You see, that's a confrontation. Using natural principles and logic. Luke eleven seventeen, But he, knowing their thoughts, said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And a house divided against a house falleth. If Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? Because you say that I cast out devils through Beelzebub. But if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God is come upon you. He's saying, okay, you're saying that the miracles I'm doing, I'm doing through the devil. Now let's ask, does this make sense? If the devil is casting out devils, what's going to happen to the devil's kingdom? If the Americans are shooting the Americans, what's going to happen to the American army? The thing you're accusing of me simply doesn't make any logical sense. That's what it comes down to. And then, of course, Jesus used parables. And he put forth a parable to those that were bidden when he marked how they chose the chief room, saying unto them, But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, and when he bade thee cometh, he may say unto you, Friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with them. Again, the rat race of life. He's confronting what they're actually doing. Instead of serving God and believing what God is doing, they're basically playing king of the hill. When they go to the party, they want a top seat, so they're all fighting over the top seat, and so on and so forth, and Jesus is confronting them on this. Luke 16, 15. And he said unto them, You are they which justify themselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Again, he's confronting those worldly things with action when people refuse to do what is right. Some people ask this question, but when you understand the background, you see why Jesus did it. Luke 19, 45. And he went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold therein and them that bought, saying unto them, It is written, My house 
is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. What was going on is that Annas, the assistant high priest, had set up in the temple all these booths where they exchange money and where they would inspect the animals. And of course, the deal is if you bring an animal from the outside and the priests that work for him have to inspect it, do you think your animal is going to pass? Because it can't have any blemishes. Absolutely not. But if you pay three times the price for the animal in the court, it already has passed, right? And I don't care if all four legs are broken, it's going to pass. And of course, they're charging more money than the normal exchange rate. So do you think if Jesus went to them and said, hey guys, you know, you really shouldn't be doing this. And another reason was they were doing it in the area of the temple that was for the Gentiles. So when the Gentiles are coming and looking at the Jewish religion, what are they seeing? All these crooks ripping everybody off. Does that make the Jewish religion look very good? So the way Jesus confronted is he made a whip and he went in and tipped the tables over and drove all the animals out and he just took care of it. Sometimes that's the way you have to confront, but that's the last resort, obviously, when there's nothing else that can be done. Putting them in a double bind. Luke 20, verse 2. And spake unto them, saying, Tell us by what authority hast thou done these things, and who is he that gave thee this authority? They're saying, Who gave you the right? It's our temple. We're running the show. For you to go in there and kick all the money changers out and kick all the animals out, who gave you that authority? See, he's being challenged. And he answered and said unto them, I will also ask you one thing, and answer me. John the Baptist, was it from heaven or from men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say, Why then believest ye him not? But if we say of men, all the people will stone us, for they are persuaded that John was a prophet. And they answered him that they could not tell whence it was. And Jesus said unto them, Neither tell I by what authority I do these things. What authority did he do them by? The authority of God. But if he did that, were they going to accept his authority? Absolutely not. So he put them in a double bind where they're going to lose both ways. And therefore he dealt with the problem. Another one. Luke 20, 25, and he said unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which be Caesar's, and unto God the things which be God's. They thought they put him in a double bind by saying, Do we pay taxes or not? He said, Show me a coin. And on the coin is a picture of Caesar. And then he hands him and says, Okay, give to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar, since his name's on it. And give to God the things that belong to God. Of course, God owns all the silver and all the gold and everything. But they were still confronted. Do you see what I'm saying? He showed them, he confronted them that they were playing a game. So he just played a game with them. Exposing men's hearts by setting boundaries with consequences. Luke 22, 21. But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me at the table. And truly the Son of Man goeth as it is determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. This is Judas. Did Judas need to be confronted? You bet. And of course, his hope was that Judas might actually change and just might say, you know, I'm doing the wrong thing. But sometimes you confront people, are they going to accept the confrontation? Are they going to put up defenses and go do it anyway? How many times, counseling, are you going to tell people? Ask them the question. Do you have biblical grounds for this divorce? No. Well, do you think it'd be a good idea to talk to God about this first before you do it? Does that mean they're going to change and they won't get the divorce? Sometimes, sometimes not. But you have to let them make the choice, right? Luke twenty-two forty-five. 45. 
And when he rose up from prayer, and he was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping with sorrow, and said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. And he could have said, Okay, they're sleeping too bad, I just won't say anything. No. He confronted them and warned them that they were going to fall into temptation if they didn't pray. But it was their choice. A couple more. Verse 48. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? What's he saying? Are you on my side? You're going to give me a kiss? I have a relationship with you and you're going to betray me? Is that the right thing? What's going on here, Judas? Then Jesus said unto the chief priests and the captains of the temple and the elders which were come to him, Be ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves? So he's confronting them. When I was daily with you in the temple, you stretched forth no hands against me. But this is your hour in the power of darkness. He's basically saying, do you see what you're doing? Do you see at each point in Jesus' ministry, when he saw things he needed to confront, did he confront them? Even in cases where he realized sometimes it wasn't going to do any good. Verse 61, And the Lord looked and turned upon Peter, and Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. Sometimes to confront, all you have to do is just look at a person. But are people different? If you had kids, you have one kid that you just look at and they break down crying, and the other kid, you're going to spank them and spank them and spank them and they're not going to cry, and they're going to fight you. Well, people are like that. So you're going to have to size up your clients and understand where they're coming from, build that relationship with them, and then figure out how to not take them face on, but be able to take them from the rear like you do in life-saving and be able to help them. Because our main goal is what? Helping them or trying to be right? No, helping them and keeping them on your team and being effective and having their best interest in mind. Remember, as a counselor, it isn't your job to prove that you're right to have all the answers. It's your job to be an effective therapist of helping the other people be healed and helped as much as you possibly can in those particular areas. Now what we're going to do is I'm going to give you particular examples. Then I'm going to shut the video off, give you a chance to write down and come up with how you would confront this particular situation. And the ones I'm giving you are ones actually counseling situations that have been modified a little bit uh, from what actually happened, but will give you the same picture, and then you're going to decide how you would confront this. And I want you to actually write down the words that you would use. Okay? Here is the first vignette. This is a drug alcohol client. I need to get this program done fast. I need to move out of town to Florida where my family lives. The sooner I get this over, the better. No, I haven't been seriously working on the first step of this stupid book, and I do not have my homework done. Okay, write down how you would respond to that. How would you confront that? Now, you might have had different ideas as to how to do that, and there's no perfect answer. Let me give you what I wrote down for that particular one. I'm sorry, but I am confused. You say that you need to get this program done fast so that you can move, but you have not even begun the first step or done your homework. Until you successfully work all 12 steps of this stupid book, you cannot complete your program. You see that? Again, you're using the material of their own contradiction to help them see the contradiction. Next one. I have not worked my drug alcohol workbook. It is a bunch of lies. I know the Bible, and this book does not line up with the Bible. I read the Bible every day, and this book is a bunch of bull. Okay, write down how you would confront that. 
Okay, hopefully you've now had your time to figure out how you would do the confrontation. And again, mine isn't the final answer. This is what I wrote down. I'm glad that you were reading your Bible and that you know a lot about what it says. However, I'm confused. As I understand it, the Christian 12-step program, and especially this one with all the Bible verses in it, is supposed to be based directly in the Bible. Could you give me some specific examples of what you do not believe lines up with the Bible? And then I would draw those out and try to talk them in a soft way, okay? Let me understand what you believe about this. And now we can talk about what I believe the book says. Because what do you think the real issue is? He doesn't want to do the book. Next. The SRS social worker took away my children when my elder son sexually abused his sister. They are just out to get me. When they told me that my son would have to leave the home or they would take away my other children away, I told them that I would never be disloyal to my son and willingly place him in a corrupt system like yours. My son belongs home with me. I can take care of my children better than any foster care parent. I just want to get a lawyer and sue them. All they want to do is take people's kids away and make them pay for the foster care to make sure they have a job. I know I need to cooperate to get my kids back. All I really want is to get my kids back as soon as possible. So how would you confront that particular situation? You had some time now to get your ideas. I'll read you what I put down here. I'm sorry, but I'm a little confused. On one hand, I hear you saying that you want to take on the SRS system, and on the other hand, I hear you saying you want to cooperate with them so you can get your kids back as soon as possible. I've actually had a number of clients that had their children taken away that were angry with the system and tried to fight it. I have actually had only one win, and for the rest, it only makes the process take longer. Which one do you think will work best, and which one do you really intend to do? I'm not sure you can do both. See the idea? Again, I want to keep them on my side, and I want to show them that I'm trying to do what's best for them. Another one. Darn it, I'm not an angry person. I went to your domestic violence group, and I am not like those other people. They are really sick. I talked to my pastor and he agrees I am not an angry person even though my wife says I am. She's just too sensitive. She was abused by her previous husband as you know. Anyone would be angry if they put up with all the stuff I've had to put up in this marriage and now she wants out. You are just a bunch of quacks trying to rip people off and destroy their marriages. I would have been better off if I had not come to you for counseling at all. My marriage was just fine. And now do you see what you've done to me? And now you're trying to blame it all on me by telling me I'm angry. I even went to a psychologist and they said I'm not angry. I've had enough and I'm going to show both of you what real anger is all about. How do you confront that one? Well, hopefully you've gotten your ideas down of how you would deal with this. I'll give you what I wrote down to deal with this. I hear you saying that the reason your marriage is failing is because you came here for counseling. If that's true, I really want to apologize. I definitely have not knowingly done anything to try to destroy your marriage, but to help you save it. And I'm sorry th things don't seem to be turning out the way you wanted them to turn out. On one hand, you're telling me you do not have an anger problem. On the other hand, you're threatening to show your wife and me what it's like when you're really angry. Is it possible that you're just really distressed that your wife wants out of the marriage and you're afraid that there's nothing you can do to change her mind? See the idea? Again, I'm going to take the soft approach, the low approach. I'm going to talk quietly. I'm going to try and calm the situation down instead of going the other way with this. And I'll give you one final one. I am not crazy. 
you are the one who is crazy. I've been to numerous psychologists with better credentials than yours, and you're the worst one yet. And I'm as good a Christian as you are. And I'm going to take that job at the university teaching karate and New Age philosophy. I know more about religions of the world than you ever thought of learning. But I just have to be good at everything. That's why I've tried professional wrestling, because I didn't care how much I got hurt just so I could win. And I won my first match until I got hurt and had to give it up. Hopefully you had some time now to write down what your response would be. And I realize these are getting more complicated and harder, but these are real situations that you could actually run into. And the question is, how would you handle them? That's the skill we're trying to get for you. Here was my answer. I'm sorry, but just because I said I think you need some help sorting out things in your life, I'm not trying to say that you're crazy. Do you see that on one hand you've been struggling in life so hard to become someone and yet you do not seem to be able to hold a job for long? That that could mean that what you are doing is not working for you. That is why I was simply wondering if you could use some assistance figuring out what the real problem is. So hopefully you've got an idea now of how to do some of the confronting and your job of course is to go home and to find contradictions and to practice particularly on people that will not be too offended and that you have a relationship with let's pray lord god we thank you that you even gave us wonderful examples lord god of how to confront people how to deal with people in life and i ask you help everybody in this class to learn how to confront effectively to keep people on their side to come across in that way that would be effective in their counseling. And we give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.